safety. So thank you everyone for being here this morning and welcome. Hi, my name is Brianna Brim. I'm an assistant professor of occupational therapy at Salus University, which is in Elkins Park. Um, today, I am joined by four of our senior interns. These are students who are about to graduate. Um, and we've prepared just some general home safety information. This is based off some of the most common topics and questions that we receive um, in working with older adults throughout the Philadelphia area. Um, I'm gonna, before we get started, I want all of our interns are gonna introduce themselves and then we'll dive right into our content. Hi, I'm Stephanie Kaplan. Hi everyone, I'm Nicole D. Robertis. Hi, my name is Mary Zhu. And hello everyone, I'm Tavio. Welcome, thank you all for coming today. We have prepared some information on some common questions and most popular topics about home safety. Some of you may be familiar with this class and some may be new, and we are sure there are already some home safety experts out there. However, our main goal today is to make sure that your questions are answered and that we spend time sharing your own experiences and resources. Many of you have probably gone through presentations about aging in place, and there are so many ways to alter your current or future residences to do that. However, participating in general home safety is one of the easiest ways to help support whatever your goals are to age in place. We have provided a handout so that you can keep some of these tips and resources for later. Please feel free to ask questions as they come to you throughout our presentation, and we can have a discussion along the way. Our goal and objectives for today are to present on some information on the most common considerations in approving home safety with these considerations for fire, electricity, carbon monoxide, clutter, false prevention, and COVID-19. And also to answer your questions about your own home. So let's start off with, why did you sign up for this class today? What are some topics that you are interested in learning more about or topics that you would like a review of? If you don't have a microphone feature, you can feel free to type something in the chat box or if you'd like to enable your microphone and ask, that's what that, that's a small enough group that we could do that as well. Am I the only person here? You're not. There's one other friend joining us and we, we suspect there might be a few more coming in a little bit later, but. Oh, okay. Well, uh, thank you for having this. I'm aware of, um, my name is Sue. Hi, Sue. Sorry. Um, I'm aware of basic safety, you know, like no rugs thrown around and um, I have a few things and but I have fallen in the bathroom in the bathtub in the bathtub. Um, and of course, I rectified that. Well, it was back in 2010. So I now have safety bars and I use a bathroom mat. Um, I just want to know if I've done everything I can. Um, I don't need to hear about COVID. I'm a little up to my ears in COVID. I already know, thank you. Um, but other things around the house, I do plan on uh, aging here at home. When time comes, I will have a chairlift put in or, uh, yeah, I think that's what they call it, chairlift. Uh, I don't need it now. I'm 69 and I, I do quite well. I take care of the house with some assistance from um, a man who cuts the grass and stuff like that. I have fallen uh, just in July of 2019 um, uh, at church. I was putting up new curtains and I was standing on the windowsill uh, inside, of course, and um, I fell, hit my back and my head, have a concussion. I have residual problems with speech, although it may not sound it now, but at some any point I can lose my memory on where we are. And I might ask you something like, what are we talking about? What is this all about? So I'm in a a speech class um, for the next eight weeks. Uh, uh, so I just need um, help with anything I might have forgotten. Uh, 
that's all. Like I have the two extinguishers in the kitchen. Everything's pretty much nailed down. You know what I mean? So it sounds like you're a little, thank you for sharing so much of that. It sounds like you're a little bit ahead of the curve, which is great. So some of this, um, but we will definitely, we definitely have some resources that we think might be helpful for you. And then um, towards the end, we can even talk about it. And it, it, we, for you in particular, it actually sounds like um, you might be a great candidate to reach out for to us after this program. We can kind of touch base one-on-one about some particular concerns. Uh, because you may not know this, but we actually have a clinic um, that provides some free services. So we will we will hit on all of that. Thank you for sharing. Um, does our other participant who's here right now have anything that they'd like to kind of share or focus on? Is there anything coming through in the chat box? It does. It actually doesn't let me see that. All right, then why don't we we keep going? Thank you again for sharing. Sure. As I'm sure you all know, our lawyers always want us to, run, to remind everyone about fire and carbon monoxide. And while that topic may not be the most exciting, fires and carbon monoxide poisoning are very serious risks to your agent in place and can pose a serious health and safety risk. Here's, here are some of our top tips. Install smoke alarms and carbon monoxide detectors on every level of your home, inside bedrooms and outside sleeping areas. It is especially important to have detectors in the basement of your lawn. It is especially important to have detectors in the basement if your laundry or furnace is located there. Um, I seen something in the chat. Okay, thank you. Thank you for listening. Um, also, we have to test smoke alarms every month. If they're not working, change the batteries. If a fire occurs in your home, get out, stay out, and call for help. Never go back inside for anything or anyone. Talk with all family members about a fire escape plan and practice the plan twice a year. I know some of you are probably thinking every month, that seems like just another thing to do on my long list of things to do. And we can relate, but try adding it to your calendar on a set day every month. Maybe coordinate it with your pet's monthly medication or surrounding another monthly event. Without the frequent checks, you are far more likely to get that annoying chirp we all dislike so much. Some of you may also be thinking that having many smoke detectors and carbon monoxide detectors is pricey alone, and then having to change all those batteries is another chore. We're gonna discuss some free and lower cost ways to help in a few moments. I also want to suggest your fire escape plan should include moving important documents to a fire safe box, somewhere that you are likely to grab it on your way out in case of a fire emergency. Smoke and carbon monoxide detectors. When thinking about purchasing smoke detectors and carbon monoxide detectors, it is important to know that these devices do have an average life expectancy. Just like your washer and dryer, they are gonna to need to be replaced. If your devices are battery operated and use a AA or a nine volt battery, those will also need to be replaced. The batteries will need to be replaced yearly, which can also become costly and wasteful. So we recommend investing in a 10 year sealed smoke detector. These devices are guaranteed under warranty for 10 years. The batteries are in a sealed compartment. So there is no threat of a grandchild taking out the batteries to use in a TV remote. Not saying I have been guilty of that myself as a child. And it also saves you the hassle of not climbing up to change them frequently. For carbon monoxide detectors, a plug-in model with a battery backup uses less battery life and is usually a good option. But the best choice would be to buy a 10-year seal combination smoke detector and carbon monoxide detector. All the benefits of a seal battery and one single device. Here we have ways to obtain a free smoke alarm for, for free. Did you know that if you live in Philadelphia, you can call 311 or contact Philly 311 via a mobile app, an email, or the website for a free smoke alarm. The fire department will contact you, the customer, to arrange delivery and installation of the smoke detector with the, the one with the 10-year lithium battery. Just please allow up to 60 days for installation 
by the fire department. They usually also send out two, um, two Philadelphia firefighters who install this, and then they'll assess your whole house and determine not just if you need one, but if you need multiple in many locations. So this could be a great way to really tap into a resource that's already there and just waiting for you. Next, let's talk fire extinguishers. There are many types of fire extinguishers out there, and some of them can be pricey, but we'll talk about some reasonably priced options. Unfortunately, unlike smoke detectors, these are generally difficult to get for free. How many of you know where your fire extinguishers are? I do. All right, Sue. So. Excellent. <laughs> How many of you still have the same one from when you first moved into your house or yeah. your it? You still have the same one? Yeah, but I look at them every so often. I just looked at them last year, the end of last year, and they they say they're good. Oh, okay. That's I great. Mean, it's right on there. Okay. okay. Yeah, good. Because of fire extinguishers, they expire too. I, I do know that. Yeah. Some, some people are often unaware that if you use a fire extinguisher once, even if it says it has some juice left in it, oftentimes it can slowly pressure over time, just like a whipped cream can. So Mom. when you do need to use it, you won't be able to shoot anything out. A good tip too is if you're looking at your fire extinguisher and there's no date on it, that's a good sign um, that it is out of date because they're, they didn't used to put the expiration dates on them. So if there is one void of an expiration date, that's probably a good um, indicator that you might want to replace that device. An ABC extinguisher is recommended for home use and that will work on any type of fire. I will also like to mention that if you try to use a fire extinguisher, and the fire does not immediately die down, then you should drop the extinguisher and get out because most portable extinguishers empty in eight seconds. Eight seconds? Eight seconds. Eight seconds. That I didn't know. Yeah, that's, that's very important. Here we have some low cost options. Since fire extinguishers are generally used for single use, most people do not need the large industrial size ones that can cost near $100. Also, if the fire is that big that you will want to use a fire extinguisher of that size, then you need to get out the house because you are in serious danger. Here are a few smaller, less expensive, and easily stored types that we have found to be helpful. You can buy the Kitty One ABC recreational fire extinguisher at Home Depot or other online retailers. And the Tundra models are particularly helpful at their small size, may encourage you to have a few in several areas of your kitchen. Just don't confuse it with hair products because the cans do look similar. Fires are still a leading cause of property damage in the US and repairs after a fire can be costly, timely and emotionally challenging. Even if you have renters or homeowners insurance, many people report that the loss of irreplaceable memories is the hardest aspect. So let's discuss some simple ways that you can decrease the risk of fire in your home. First, let's discuss what you should look out for. Some noticeable hazards include sparking. If you plug a device in and it starts sparking, unplug the device immediately. You may also notice visible burn marks or discoloration on the outlet, or even a smoky smell coming from that direction. The outlet may make a buzzing or popping sound when items are plugged in or feel hot to the touch. If any of these hazards occur, do not use that outlet until it has been fixed. Now let's talk about some ways you can ensure that outlets are being used safely. Make sure that all your outlet covers are intact and that there are no wires exposed. Many people are unaware that power strips or surge protectors should only ever be plugged directly into a wall outlet and that you should never plug multiple surge protectors or power strips together as it can lead to an increased fire risk. Also, extension cords should not be used with surge protectors in most instances inside the home and only some extension cords can be plugged in a chain. So it is very important to read the safety labels on all your extension cords. 
Another important safety tip is to plug all major appliances directly into a wall outlet. Examples of appliances include your washer, dryer, refrigerator, and air conditioner. Do not plug these items into a surge protector or extension cords, as this will increase the risk of fire. If you notice that you have an appliance with a damaged wire or cord, discard of that appliance as it is not safe to use. If you feel that outlets or electric devices within your home are unsafe or pose a fire risk, reach out to an electrician. They can help answer any questions and make any necessary repairs. It is also really important when discussing fire prevention that we talk about space heaters and radiators. We are going to specifically focus on electric or plug-in space heaters as they are the most common. If you are using a gas or kerosene space heater, it is really important that you read all the safety instructions closely as many of those are not safe for inside the home. Unfortunately, some of those devices, if they are used inside the home, can actually lead to a carbon monoxide buildup and unfortunately have had led to many deaths in the United States. So very important that you read all safety instructions for those alternative types of models. Space, heater, space heaters use a lot of electricity in most instances and can overload a power strip or extension cord quickly. So it's really important that you plug it directly into a wall outlet. To limit fire risks, turn off your space heater before leaving the room. You do not wanna leave your space heater unattended. Before leaving the house to run errands, double check that your space heater is turned off. Make sure to keep the surrounding area free from all objects. Keep the space heater at least three feet away from any papers, bags, clothing, curtains, rugs, and furniture. Always place the space heaters on a level surface to prevent it from falling over. Avoid placing it on top of cabinets, carpets, furniture, or any area that can overheat and cause a fire. For those of you that are looking to purchase a new space heater, it is highly recommended that you look for devices with an auto off feature. This is a great safety feature that will automatically shut the heater off in the event that the device overheats or falls over. If your home has radiators, here are a few tips as those can be very hot and can pose some fire risks as well. If your home has other types of heating, such as baseboards or floor vents, this slide is not really going to apply to you as much. The first tip is to use caution when moving around the radiator and avoid touching it. If you are feeling unsteady, do not lean on the radiator or use it to hold yourself up. The metal pipes become extremely hot and can cause burns if touched. In order to avoid fires, keep the area around your radiator clean and open. Keep cloth and wooden furniture away from the radiator. It is important to also be mindful of curtains as they can pose a fire risk when they are hung too close to the radiator. So let's switch gears and talk about lighting. Some of you might be thinking, great, fire safety and now lighting, these topics are getting progressively more boring, but lighting is really important. As we age, our eyes require three times the light we previously needed to see well. Plus, how many of you feel like with the newer LED bulbs, some rooms in your, some rooms in your home seem darker? I feel like my own room was a cave until I found out that LED bulbs could be used to my advantage. But before we get into all that good stuff, let's discuss some basic lighting facts. Lighting. So why does lighting matter? Good lighting is important to make daily tasks easier and decrease the risk of tripping, slipping, or falling. And an unfortunate statistic is that one in three seniors over the age of 65 fall every year. Unfortunately, a lot of these falls can be related back to some level of poor lighting or the inability to see the object that was placed in front of the individual. So lighting not only is important to make you more successful in completing tasks, but it can literally be the difference between a fall occurring and not occurring. Plus some medication and medical diseases may make it harder for your eyes to see and adjust to other light levels. So making lighting a really important thing to consider in your home and keeping you safe. Types of lighting. So let's talk about different types of lighting. Ambient lighting, or general overhead lighting is the kind of light that hangs from your ceiling. This includes lights such as chandeliers, track lights, and pot lights. Task lighting or practical lighting is 
uh, to light up a specific area for a work area. And it's more like a desk lamp to light up your desk and nothing else. And accent lighting is more like a spotlight to highlight something like a frame portrait. Accent lighting tends to be the least practical of all the lighting. So this is kind of if you have one of those fancy Tiffany lamps or like a sconce on the wall that makes your room look really nice, but doesn't actually provide you a whole lot of light. We're not going to talk too much about accent lighting. Most of what we're going to reference is going to be in, in regards to ambient and task lighting because those two types of lighting are the single best ways to decrease your risk of falls by altering how you use light bulbs um, and those fixtures. So the million dollar question, and some of you may have identified this, that LED light bulbs, the new light bulbs don't feel as bright as some of the older light bulbs. So most of us are used to these light bulbs, right? The standard incandescent, it's got that filament in it. So these light bulbs have been around forever and most of us have grown really accustomed to using them. Um, about a decade ago, the government started a slow phase out of these light bulbs, however. The slow phase out of this light bulb happened because as most of you know, these things get really, really hot. So they increase the fire risk within a home substantially. And there was a whole series of fires that happened, I believe in around the late 1990s due to um, plastic lampshades and these getting too hot with the plastic lampshades. So they started a targeted phase out. On top of being really hot, they use a lot, a lot of energy. So they're super inefficient as far as energy goes. So some of you who've already started to switch and maybe you were an early adopter of switching to a different type of light bulb, like an LED or a compact fluorescent, you may have started to notice that your energy bill went down the second you did that. That's because these guys are just so wasteful. They get so hot and they don't last long. How many of you have secret stockpiles of light bulbs because you know that they're gonna burn out in six months. So you've just bought a ton of them. So what's gonna start to happen is you're not gonna be able to get these anymore. They are not gonna be sold in Home Depot or Lowe's. They're gonna become less and less frequent due to this government phase out. So in response to that, light bulb companies started to develop alternative designs like compact fluorescent and LED. So compact fluorescent is the one you think about that corkscrew. So some of you have some of these and then LED, light emitting diode is what that stands for. And these are these kind of guys. Now, when both of these started to come out, they were super expensive. And at the time that they came out, they were super expensive and you could still get our standard old school, good old reliable incandescent light bulb. Well, with the government phase out, the good news is these are now comparable to what the old incandescents cost. So they're no longer nearly as expensive as they used to be, which is a good thing. Plus the technology has come such a far way that some of the problems with them um, that people had if you started trying to use these five years ago are no longer issues. So ultimately people started to get away from these compact fluorescent light bulbs because oftentimes they can contain a heavy metal that can be hazardous to the environment. So they have to be disposed of properly. So instead LEDs are now the favorable. Okay, but Brianna, you still haven't answered my question. Why do they feel less bright? I'm getting there, we're working on it. So all of us have been used to this for our whole life. And when I say this type of light bulb, how do you measure this type of light bulb? You measure it in watts, right? If I say to you a 60 watt light bulb, your brain has a good idea of how bright that is. If I say a hundred watt light bulb, your brain has an idea of how bright that is too, right? We've all gotten used to these. We know what these look like. However, um, so when we'd go to replace them, we would just look at the size of the light bulb and we'd look at the watt and then we would buy that and we'd be done. Well, with the newer phase out, they also developed an entirely new system for labeling light bulbs. And that is something that a lot of people struggle to use because unfortunately the new labeling system says that if you wanted to replace this 60 watt light bulb, all you needed to do was pick up an LED package that said 60 watt replacement. The problem is they are not actually equivalent and I'm gonna tell you why. So that's why it feels dark because it's not like a one-to-one -one replacement. You're not actually getting a 60 watt bulb 
is actually going to be brighter than the 60 watt replacement bulb. And we're gonna show you how, okay? So this might look familiar, this little box, because it kind of looks like the nutrition facts box on every box of oatmeal or cereal in the entire world, right? Like you've seen this format before, but a lot of the information used is probably newer and familiar, okay? So again, so this label that we're looking at, this is a label for a standard incandescent. So one of the old school, old faithful bulbs, that's what we're looking at right now. So it uses 60 watts, okay? And watt is actually a measurement of how much juice is being taken out of the wall. How much electricity does it take to, to make this sucker work? Now we think, so a higher watt takes more energy and therefore makes it look brighter to us. But the new LED technologies, that's not the case. This uses such less electricity that we can actually make this so much brighter without having a very high wattage, okay? So we've only ever looked at this bottom section, but what we want you to start doing when you go shopping for new light bulbs is starting to look at the other sections. So the two middle sections, um, again, this is just looking at, and we're gonna compare in a second. So we're looking at a standard incandescent. So it costs at least $7 a year to run every single incandescent. That's kind of a lot of money. And it might only, if you run it only three hours a day, it might give you like a year, year, almost two, year and a half, somewhere around there before you have to replace that. But that's if you only use it three hours a day. Some of you are thinking, well, my light bulb in my living room is on probably close to 16 hours a day. I always leave that thing on, right? So you're gonna get even less time out. What we want you to start paying attention is this thing at the top that says brightness. Brightness is measured in lumens. The old faithful incandescent bulb, a 60 watt incandescent bulb generally has somewhere between 800 and 1100 lumen, okay? That's a lot of lumen and that's what you're used to. However, some of the new LED light bulbs that are labeled as a 60 watt replacement might have like 650 lumen. That's a big difference. So why does it feel dimmer? Because it actually is. It's not nearly as bright as what you're used to. So you think you're buying a one-to-one -one replacement but you're getting something that is intentionally dimmer, okay? So we want you to start looking at lumens when we look at this. So that begs the question, what should I buy and how should I do this? So the first thing you wanna do is if you know you're replacing a light bulb that's a 60 watt light bulb, don't just go and find the one that says 60 watt replacement LED. Ignore that line completely. Pick up the box, look at the back of the box, and look at the lumen, okay? You wanna look at the lumen first and we want the higher lumen. Most folks feel that for like task lighting and overhead lighting, somewhere around 1100 lumen is gonna feel bright enough for them to do their tasks, okay? Could you go more? Absolutely, but most people say about 1100 feels good for them. And then just double check that that wattage, that bottom line is below 60, because as long as it, which it will be if it's LED, because they're so energy efficient. So look at this. This is, this is a light bulb fact for this light bulb, which is labeled a 100 watt replacement light bulb. It's labeled 100. So if you went to the store and you said, hmm, I need to replace this 60 watt light bulb, and you picked up a 60 watt replacement, you'd only be getting about 600 lumen and you would be, and it would use about three watts. But I could just pick up the 100 watt replacement, which some of you may have been scared about because you're like, is that gonna work in my outlet? Yes, it will work in that same device. You're gonna get 1600 lumen, which is gonna be super bright. It's gonna make reading so much easier. It's gonna make cutting your food so much easier. And it's only using 15 watts. So it's still using a quarter of the energy that our incandescent would use. So it's gonna save you a ton of money. And look at that lifespan, 13 years. 13 years this light bulb is gonna last me and it's gonna only cost me under $2. So we went from a light bulb that's gonna last us maybe a year and a half, 
and cost us eight bucks a year to a light bulb that's going to last us 13, be way brighter and only cost us $2 a year. That's a huge difference. And that's something that, that has not been well advertised and leads a lot of people into buying these, these replacement bulbs when really they could be buying bulbs that make their life a lot easier. So knowledge is power in all of these situations, right? So now you have the ability to make those spaces brighter so that you don't feel like it, your living room is a cave. Because I can tell you that that's something that we've all experienced and I know how frustrating it is. Um, and in working with the older adults that I've worked with, they were the ones who brought this to my attention. And then I said, you know what, you're right. My living room's a cave too, until we figured all of this stuff out. Mary, did you wanna jump in and talk about light temperature? Yes. So this green bubble right here talks about light appearance. And color temperature is a way to describe light appearance of a light bulb. And it is measured in degrees of Kelvin, which is, which is basically a capital letter K. And the higher the Kelvin, the wider the light. And this may not make much sense yet, but I'll explain more on the next slide. So choosing the right color. Some of you might be thinking and looking at the picture and think which one you prefer. And that's because a lot of the older incandescent light bulbs had a much yellower and warmer color to them. So warmer lighting, which is the first box, is really good for relaxation and falling asleep. It's great for bedrooms and living rooms. And if you've ever heard of the circadian rhythm, it's like an internal body clock that runs in a like 24 hour cycle. And yellow and orange light has very little effect on that clock. Neutral lighting, which is in the middle, is good for helping you stay awake and do work. It's also good as ambient lighting in kitchens, bathrooms, and offices. And the last one, the blue one, that's cool lighting. So that's good for task lighting, such as reading, um, lighting for under the cabinet, and it's really great for basement and garages. Blue light has a strong impact on our circadian rhythm, and this is because blue light is a part of white light, and this makes it difficult for you to stay in bed and go to sleep. Blue light waves come from fluorescent and LED lights and backlit electronic screens on televisions, computers, tablets, and cell phones. So think about the last time you were at the doctor's office and there were those overhead fluorescent lights and they kind of felt abrasive and uncomfortable. Those are generally in that blue light spectrum. And most of us don't care for those. However, they can be very beneficial at keeping us alert and awake during some of those more intensive tasks. Like if you're trying to um, organize your medications or you're trying to cut food um, or you're just trying to wake up in the morning. Some people like to put these in the bathroom um, where they do makeup or shaving because it makes them more alert. But it also tells your brain, stay awake. So if you're using these types of light after the sun sets, it's actually gonna impact your sleep cycle. And a lot of us have a hard time sleeping anyway. So by switching certain areas of our house to warmer, more yellow tones um, in the living room, if that's where you like to relax at the end of the day or your bedroom where you like to maybe read, that's gonna actually help promote sleep, which is a really important um, thing to think about when you're looking at light bulb color. Again, some people also just has preference, like Mary said. I really like warm white light in most of my spaces. The only space that I keep daylight in is my office to keep me alert. But the rest of my house, I use a warm white because I find it relaxing to myself. So there is a matter of personal preference, but you can kind of manipulate this light color to the best of your advantage. There's a lot of cool products out on the market right now, actually, um, if you're interested, there's a lot of new smart lighting um, type bulbs. And there's one particular brand um, that I'm really familiar with and I've started using in my house. I can actually change the light color. So not just the lumen and how bright it is, the same light bulb, I could make it blue during one part of the day and more of that yellow hue on another type of the day. So there's a lot of smart lighting options. We actually have an entire class on lighting. If you'd like more information on this, just reach out um, to Center on the Hill or Mary Angela and let her know, and then we will try to get it scheduled for you. Okay. So the best kind of light bulb, as Brianna said earlier, is the light emitting diode, which is the LED. And LEDs are better for the environment and your budget. They're significantly more efficient and longer lasting than normal incandescent bulbs or halogen bulbs, if you have those. So ultimately, this saves you more money over the life of the bulb, lifespan of the bulb, and they're also much less prone to breaking than the fragile filaments that you see in incandescent bulbs. And the one we have listed here is a dimmable replacement 
And to talk about dimmable versus non-dimmable, um, dimmable bulbs can be installed in any kind of lighting fixture, but non-dimmable bulbs can't be installed in lights that have dimmable features. So when you turn on the light and you have different clicks, non-dimmable light bulbs can't be installed in those. And they just burn out quicker. That's their only problem is they burn out quicker. If you put a if you put a non-dimmable in a three-way bulb or on, on one of those slidey switches, it's not going to last you the 13 years. You might only get five out of it, which is still good. But so keep in mind that if you need it to be put in a dimmable switch, they'll be labeled as dimmable versus non-dimmable right on the outside of the package. And the cool fact is this exact light bulb is that light bulb fact that we gave you, that, that last one we, where we were comparing with the incandescent, that's exactly for this bulb. And in fact, many light bulb, many LED bulbs are made of plastic, so that's much safer to touch. And when you're screwing them in or out, it's much more durable. So you're very unlikely to have to do that old potato trick that many of us have had to do after we've broken a light bulb in a fixture. So now we're gonna switch gears and talk about fall prevention. Now we know everyone hates to talk about this word, but knowledge is power and it's important to identify potential challenges head on. So let's discuss some common areas and causes where people tend to fall the most. Can anyone guess the most common location of a fall? Bathroom. No. Kitchen? No, you're actually really correct. The um, bathroom is the top one. Oh. Um, we we're actually going to say your home is actually the top place for falls, but you're correct in your home. Um, the bathroom is the most common place. Um, so also stairs is up there as well when you're carrying heavy objects like laundry baskets or groceries. And if you have loose railings as well as slippery walkways or if there's water on the floor. And also you did mention earlier about unsecured area rugs, which we will touch on in a little bit. So we know a lot of people have been told that they need to eliminate all area rugs. And frankly, I find that notion a little offensive because I really like my area rugs. They do a lot for design and I like the way they look in my house. So if you're like me, I understand you, but we need to make sure they're secured. And we're going to give you some tips for the easiest way to make sure that your area rugs aren't slipping under your feet or potentially causing you to trip. But the truth is that the cause of falls is actually related more to a person's physical health and changes versus the specific location. So now we're gonna dive deeper into those personal health factors that affect the likelihood of a fall happening. Some of these include recent changes to medication, recent surgery, hospitalization, or illness, unregulated blood pressure, straining during a bowel movement, getting up to use the bathroom in the middle of the night because you're less oriented to spaces in the dark, movements that are too rapid, or decreased general awareness of surroundings due to the decreased lighting or recent arrangement. So oftentimes people who have to get up to use the bathroom in the middle of the night on top of being less oriented to the space in the dark, there's also the urgency of trying to get to the bathroom in time, which does increase falls risk substantially. And unfortunately, when oftentimes people try to make their home safer by rearranging things. And unfortunately, we actually can see an increase in fall just to you changing some of your furniture situations around your house. So it's especially important that if you've recently moved, rearranged rooms, that you take extra caution when you're moving around those spaces. So the first thing to ask yourself is what specifically can you do to prevent any tripping or stumbling? Staying fit is a top priority. So it's important to talk to your doctor to make sure you are as healthy enough, you are healthy enough to participate in balance exercises or general walking. Some of you may or not may or may not be aware that many health insurance companies cover gym memberships for older adults through silver sneakers or a similar type program. Staying healthy, which includes getting a good decent night's sleep, eating nutritious food, taking medications as prescribed and staying hydrated, which I know I'm guilty of not drinking as much as I should, um, and also eating enough fiber. Remember that even if you are generally healthy, having a recent medication change, surgery or illness can increase your risk of falling or losing your balance. 
Especially for those of you who may have recently been diagnosed with something like diabetes or a heart condition or even a thyroid condition where medication changes are really common when you're early in your diagnosis, it's very important to understand that just that alone increases your falls risk substantially and so that you need to take extra caution and slow your movements down during those periods. Using any mobility devices that your doctor has recommended for you, including any canes or walkers, is only going to be beneficial to you. Ask your doctor to see a physical therapist if you do feel unsteady. Many, many older adults find it really helpful to actually find a physical therapist that they trust and do almost a yearly checkup for their balance. And that's one thing that people don't always recognize is that and usually in a few quick visits, they can help you give some exercises that you, be, you will be able to do on your own. And most PTs are willing to work with you. So if you're concerned that you have a high copay or a high deductible through your insurance company, and you express that to your physical therapist early on, they can work with you to maybe schedule your visits once a week, or maybe just follow up with them like a month after, after they give you a home program. They're very flexible. So please don't shy away from physical therapy if you feel that you have any changes to your balance because it can be immensely helpful at preventing falls. And last but not least, please wear sturdy footwear with a back when possible. This will lessen slipping by giving you support. So now we're gonna switch gears and talk about how your own environment can play a role in fall prevention. Lighting tops the list for environmental components. Mary went into detail already regarding types of lighting and what to look for, but we wanted to mention it again due to its importance. The brighter, the better. So just remember to increase the lumen when possible. Make sure you have well-lit pathways both inside and outside your home because especially this time of year with it getting darker earlier, it can in increase the likelihood of a fall. Uh, using motion censored activated night lights on your path from your bedroom to bathroom for late night bathroom trips is also a great option. Here are a few simple and easy potential modification ideas to help increase the safety in your home. The first one is to consider grab bars in your tub or shower if you have noticed changes in your balance or you do have frequent medication changes as this can alter your center of gravity. Make sure your handrails, both inside and outside, are sturdy. If you do ever find yourself holding onto a certain wall or a piece of furniture, installing a handrail is the safest option. Also, an interesting fact is that handrails do need to be installed into the studs. Remember that towel racks are not sturdy. Using non-skid strips on stairs helps you give more traction with the floor, reducing slipping, as does securing any area rugs. Home Depot has a cheap rug traction anti-slip tape seen on this slide that can fix all of those problems. I One personally use this product in my house. I've tried many, many, many different methods of securing area rugs. And this blue line tape is actually the best product. And I have new hardwoods in one area of my home and I can attest that it does not damage your floors. It's still easy to remove. And it's so secure that I can actually run a vacuum right over that area rug and it doesn't move one bit. So this is one of the best products and that roll should allow you to be able to do several of your carpets. If you have a hard time getting on your hands and knees, maybe due to a knee replacement or a back injury, this is also something that um, a handy person or maybe even, you know, um, a family member would be happy to do for you. It's very quick and it's very effective at decreasing your falls risks. One other thing that I would like to mention about the, um, the towel racks is unfortunately a lot of falls that I have seen um, and worked with were for people who reached out and tried to use a towel rack or one of those soap dispensers that's a tile installed. What's really important to remember is oftentimes those are only installed using a screw that's rated for maybe 35 pounds. And if you're talking about the towel, the um, soap or the washcloth, 
uh, towel racks that are installed on tile, those are only being held in by grout, meaning that if you put any kind of force through them, they're potentially going to rip right off the wall and you're going to fall down with them. So it's really important that if you do notice you're holding on to those things, that you consult someone about installing safer grab bars to make sure that they're installed correctly. Um, if it's something you're interested in, we'll have more information at the end of how to contact us, but we would actually be happy to help draw up um, where take pictures of your bathroom and help you draw up recommendations of where to put things for the best for you. So when in doubt, call a professional if you feel you need assistance with any home modifications. Like Brianna just said, we have resources that we're going to share with you at the end of this presentation and, and they're all sent out. So feel, feel, feel free to reach out to them. So another factor that plays in plays a role in falls is having anything such as clutter in the way. We're actually having a whole class on decluttering on February 28th, virtually through Center on the Hill, just like this class. So please sign up if you are interested. So today we're gonna give you a few general tips to start to think about. Using the 30 seconds or less rule is a great tagline to remember. If a task takes less than 30 seconds, it should be completed right away. This can include things such as weeding out junk mail, washing your dish, or throwing away rotten food. Another tip is before you buy something, think twice about it if you really need it. Switch to electronic records to avoid bills in the mail and having them accumulate on the counter. If anyone is interested in learning how to digital declutter, please let us know as this is another class we could host. If you have any if you find you're keeping magazines or newspapers for one article, rip the article out and save it in a binder or folder to reference back later. At the end of the day, make sure you reward yourself for any removal of clutter as it's definitely not an easy task. So it would only be right to talk about bathroom safety as this is a top place for loss of balance to occur. Here are some tips to keep in mind. Keep the area well lit. Use bath mats with rubber backing so they stay in place. Consider using tub or shower strips to reduce slipping in the tub. A toilet seat riser is also a great option that can make getting up easier. By raising the seat, you may prevent falling while using the restroom. It's also important to remember if you're in a position where you actually need to replace your toilet in your home for whatever reason, it's broken, it's not working, um, or maybe you're like me and one of them is still those lovely avocado cuddlers and you're deciding to upgrade. Um, they do have, a lot of the newer toilets are higher standard height. So instead of a 22 or a 24 inch toilet, you can actually find one that are like 28. And I think I've even seen one up to 30 inches. I upgraded one upstairs and it really does just make it a little bit easier to get on and off the toilet, um, which is just one less way of preventing falls, especially if you're someone who's frequently getting up in the middle of the night to use the restroom. Keeping the floor clear of any debris or clothing that could become a hazard is a good idea as well as keeping the floor dry. We all know wet floors create change of situations and never have good outcomes. Finally, consider having a tub or shower bench and or grab bars installed if you do feel unsteady. Another frequently visited room in the house is the kitchen. Here are some tips to keep in mind while in this space. Keep the area well lit. Increase task lighting, like mentioned earlier, above the sink, stove, and in common work areas. Also, remember to use the highest lumen possible for all fixtures. Reduce clutter to allow for easy navigation of the space. Do not block used cabinets with chairs or other furniture. Add a non-slip mat to the sink or areas where water does splash. Keep floors clear and do not store items on the floor. Do not leave cabinets or drawers open. Avoid using floor wax and don't walk on just clean floors until you know they've completely dried. Store frequently used or heavier items within reach and avoid storing in high cabinets to decrease the risk of injury. So I know, Sue, that you stated your little COVID-19 out and I think we all are, but I think it's important to just touch base a little bit on a couple things because some of you might be thinking, gee, you know, maybe I do need to get a handy person out here to look at some 
of my spaces to make them safer for me. Or maybe I do want to have someone come in and remove some extra unneeded objects from my home. Or maybe you want to see an electrician. And it's a really valid concern to have these individuals come into your house during the time of COVID-19. So the question becomes, how can I stay safe and still make sure I'm having some of these necessary repairs or potentially optional repairs that are being done? So my first tip is always to use a reputable and trusted company. Use someone that you have good references, possibly from a friend. We have a couple organizations at the end that we've worked with that we trust as well. When you call to make your appointment, ask them about their COVID-19 policies. Are they encouraging frequent testing of their employees? Do they tell their employees not to come in when they're feeling sick? Are they doing temperature checks? Those kinds of things so that you can feel comfortable that you're working with a company that takes COVID as seriously as you do. With any type of work on your house, again, always important to verify that before you let anyone inside your house that they are from the company that you called and they are there when you anticipated them being there as just general safety. You, it is absolutely reasonable to ask anyone coming into your house to do work to wear a mask that covers their nose. And we recommend that you also wear a mask while they're in your home. Now, if you are upstairs and they're working in the basement, you don't necessarily have to wear your mask the whole time. But if you're gonna be interacting within the same space or just a room over, it would be advisable for you to wear a mask as well. It's not unreasonable to ask them to sanitize or wash their hands immediately upon entering your house. I keep a bottle of hand sanitizer right next to my door and I've recently had to have some heat work done to my house and I've never had a handy person say to me, no, I will not sanitize my hands. If I just ask them and then we all feel a little bit more comfortable. It also sets the tone for the visit. They know then that I'm taking this seriously and are gonna be more respectful of my wishes. Always important to make sure you disinfect any surfaces, including doorknobs and switches after they leave. It would even be polite of you to disinfect before they come just to make sure your germs aren't traveling to them as well, right? And then as always, after you disinfect, throw away the paper towels that you use to disinfect. If you used cloth to clean it, just make sure you throw those in the laundry so that you're not potentially spreading germs other places. And then as always, after you clean, wash your hands to make sure that there's nothing left. Now, I know that a lot of us were raised um, with manners that when someone comes into our house, we shake their hands. During the time of COVID, not the best protocol, but old habits die hard. So if you do find that you still reached out to shake someone's hand, we advise that you go and wash your hands immediately, especially if before consuming any food or liquid. Now that we have talked about strategies to make your home safer, we are going to talk about some resources in the area that can assist you with any repairs or modifications that may need to be made within your home. Ralston MyWay is a nonprofit home care agency and they focus on helping individuals age within their community. In order to qualify for these services, individuals must be 55 years or older and reside in Northwest Philadelphia. Northwest Philadelphia does include Chestnut Hill, Mount Airy, Germantown, and other sections of Northwest Philadelphia as well. So their service area is quite broad. Some of the low cost services that they offer include home care, such as bathing, dressing, housekeeping, laundry, and meal prep. They also offer transportation services to doctor's appointments, grocery stores, pharmacies, and social events, as well as services for handyman repairs and yard work. Please contact, please contact them if you feel you could benefit from these services. Their phone number and email are provided on page seven of your handout. I've personally been working with this organization for close to five years. Um, we previously were going into seniors home to do safety checks. Unfortunately, COVID has kind of, you know, put a little halt to that. But I can say that um, they're, because this is an organization solely focused on helping older adults, they are very compassionate and understanding of the needs of, of older adults. Um, and they're really a pleasure to work with. So I, we highly recommend them. They're, um, their handy people are very trustworthy, which I know is a real concern when you're trying to invite people into your home to do work. Another great resource in this area is HomeNet Solutions. 
They are a free contractor referral service and have a network of over 1,300 pre-qualified and insured contractors. They can assist with a wide range of home improvement and repair services, including carpentry, electrical services, flooring, windows, and roofing. If you have a project or repairs that you need assistance with, give HomeNet Solutions a call and they will match you up with a contractor who is right for the job. The last home repair resource we are going to talk about is the PCA Senior Housing Assistance Repair Program, also known as SHARP. They assist with minor home repairs, such as repairing steps, installing smoke alarms, replacing electrical switches and outlets, and repairing leaky faucets and toilets. They also assist with minor home modifications for seniors with physical disabilities, such as installing grab bars and hand railings. In order to qualify for these services, you must meet the following criteria. Be age 60 years or older. Your name must be on the deed for the property. There must be sound and functioning utilities within your home, and there are income guidelines that need to be met. Please give them a call to find out if you qualify. For those of you who aren't already kind of registered with the Philadelphia Corporation for the Aging, we highly recommend that as a great resource. So if you go on their website, you can actually sign up for their newsletter and they periodically offer a lot of free classes. They offer a lot of additional information. And when grant programs become available, they will advertise them there and you'll be the first to know. So sometimes, you know, so there was one grant program several years ago where they received money for um, smoke alarms for people who had um, hearing loss. So that was just a grant program and everybody on the PCA mailing list was notified. So I would reach out to their website if you're familiar with them and try to get on their, on their list so that you can be aware of everything that's going on. They offer a lot of services and are a great resource for um, any older adult in the city of Philadelphia. Now that we have covered some resources that help with home repairs, we are going to switch gears and talk about healthcare services. Salus University has multiple health clinics that offer a wide array of services. The Eye Institute offers comprehensive eye exams as well as specialty services for various conditions, including glaucoma, cataracts, and diabetic eye disease. They also offer contact lens fittings and low vision services to help clients with vision impairments achieve goals such as reading, identifying street signs and bus numbers, and managing household tasks. An optical shop is located on site and can help fit you for a new pair of glasses. The Eye Institute has two locations with one of them being located right here in Cherry Hill. The contact information can be found on screen and is also located in your handout. Uh, excuse me, so it's in located in Chestnut Hill. We apologize for that one. And then the other one is located in Oak Lane. The Pennsylvania Ear Institute is another clinic that is affiliated with Salus and provides audiology services. They offer comprehensive hearing evaluations, balance evaluations, and perform hearing aid fittings and repairs. If you feel any of these services can benefit you, feel free to give them a call and schedule an appointment. Located in the same building as the Pennsylvania Ear Institute is the Speech Language Institute. In this clinic, speech language pathologists provide complementary services that focus on communication, cognition, memory, stuttering, and swallowing. So if you notice any changes in your memory or find yourself misplacing objects, we recommend reaching out to them for a quick checkup. So with the Speech Language Institute services, they offer also many support groups and their services are free. So if you are finding that some of your co-pays to see a private speech language pathologist um, are becoming a little bit more than you can manage, this might be a really great option. And if you check their website out, they have many support groups that are open to the public for various, um, for various conditions. It, sometimes people don't always know what speech language pathologists do, but they really can do a lot to help maintain all of your mental focus and memories um, and combat if you have any um, out of the ordinary changes in cognition. Lastly, we have the Occupational Therapy Institute. 
This is a brand new clinic at Salus that offers free occupational therapy services. If you are listening to this presentation and feel you are having a harder time with home safety, reach out to OTI. We can address home safety, fall prevention, medication management, chronic disease management and prevention, pain and scar management, and work with you to remain as independent as possible with tasks such as dressing, bathing, and feeding. The contact information and addresses for each clinic can be found on page seven of your handout. And information for all the Salus clinics and services they offer can be found at salusuhealth.com. And that website is also listed on your handout. The best way to get in touch with us if you think you might benefit from individual or group occupational therapy services, which are also free of charge, is oti at salus.edu. Um, and we'd be happy to meet with you to talk about whether or not we need continued services or if we can just give you a couple tips to get you on your way um, to better safety and better independence. Lastly, we have some recommended products to make you and your home safer. Some of these products we already mentioned throughout and just want to remind you, the plug-in LED motion sensors. These are warm white with adjustable brightness, so it won't deserve your sleep-wake cycle talked about earlier. We also have stick-ons as another option, as well as a toilet bowl nightlight, which is motion activated too. Um, we have here listed the rug traction anti-slip rubber tape and the non-slip tub strips, which um, are offered in white. And then additionally, we have the laundry backpack with the shoulder straps. And this one comes with a pocket, which is convenient. And this material is nylon, which can be way sturdier than some of the netted options. The reason we bring up this particular product is we have a lot of clients who we've worked with whose laundry is in the basement and carrying that two handled laundry basket down the steps often when it's very heavy doesn't leave a hand to hold on to railings and can increase falls risk. So this backpack version can make your life just a little bit easier, keeping you hands free and thus preventing falls even a little bit better. And because it's washable, you could throw it in the wash with your clothes. And then when it comes out, it's clean for your clean clothes. So you're not worried about dirty clothes going, clean clothes going back into a dirty receptacle. So with that, that's our main presentation and we want to make sure we have as much time as possible for questions or comments or any other topics that you would love to bring up. We are so grateful that you came today and if you're watching this later, we're thankful that you tuned in. Um, we're always here to help. You can just reach out to us at oti at salus.edu and that handout um, is going to be available um, I believe uh, Mary Angel is going to be posting that and sending it out to those of you who are here with us today. So with that, any questions? Okay, I want to thank everyone. You covered a lot. I think I learned a lot more about lighting that I knew. So that was uh, hugely helpful. And I am familiar with Ralston's My Way Through Journey's Way. That is our Roxbar Senior Center, and I am a member there. Um, of course, you know it's been closed since last March, so I haven't been doing my exercises, even though they send out, um, <clears throat> you can Zoom and exercise, but I don't want to do that in here. Um, so I walk but I just wish I were a little more consistent. Um, and uh, some of your, um, your resources were helpful. I wrote them down and um, I, th I think it was a very good uh, review for me of some things I need to uh, change, like some of those smoke detectors. I have plenty of them, they're in every room but uh, I don't check on them. I usually check on them when they beep. <clears throat> and so it was, a, it was very beneficial to me and I thank you all, all you ladies, thank you. Thank you. You're very welcome. We're so appreciative of your engagement too. That's oh, always, nice. always nice to hear. Oh, well, I'll tell her to have you folks again for, for those who have missed you. That's a shame for them, but 
Oh, well. But thank you very much. Oh, you're very Appreciate welcome. It. Okay. You're welcome. Good thank luck to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sue, for joining us. And just to let you all know, we got a, another thank you from the other participant in the chat. Um, she said, thank you. I really appreciated it and learned a lot. Bye. So just before she yes. left, she sent that chat. So Wonderful. Know if everyone saw it. So thank you all very, very much. Um, as I mentioned, I, I did record this. So this will be posted along with the handout. And I am uh, literally about to hit send, sending the handout to those who are here today. So be great. I, I definitely learned a lot. This was a wonderful presentation. Um, and I expect uh, once I, I post it and share it, we're going to get a lot of people um, who will who'll benefit from this as well. So Thank you. Well, we're always happy to be here. Let us know if you need us in the future. Um, and if anybody reaches out to you um, about any topics they'd like to see, you know, if it's in our wheelhouse, we'll do the best we can.